We have been looking at a topic in Genesis called Foundations Revisited. It's the foundations for any good society that operates well. And one of the principles we discover from the life of Abram, before his name is changed to Abraham, we'll get to that later in Genesis, is the principle of giving to God first out of your resources. Now I know that sermons about giving are not popular. It's a great way to empty out the church. But where it comes up in the scriptures, I will always, always teach it. I don't do a lot of time on, uh, you know, harping on pledges or anything like that. We have a wonderful, if you look at the, the budget, uh, you are a faithful, faithful group. We have some people who give by the internet when they watch the uh, messages. Uh, but I, it, it, you've been a wonderful, wonderful group, and our leadership manages money very, very well at this church. They've been doing it for years and years, and I have to compliment that. And the one thing, the one principle that I've said is that as a pastor, I don't ever want to know what anybody gives. I don't ever want to know, you know, uh, anything about your finances or any of that kind of thing. Uh, I just want them to give me the, the, the church budget and make sure that we're on target and let them, uh, the leadership, take care of it. And they do an admirable job. Well, we come to Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. And... We find that this concept of a creation responsible to a creator is the only sal solid foundation for personal, national, global health and security in our world. If our world listened to the principles of giving to God first, if our world was responsible to God in its finances, we wouldn't be in the shape we're in in our world, and particularly we wouldn't be in the shape we're in in the United States with such a deficit. Uh, that's something that's on the political side. I'm not going to talk about that very much today, except to say that finances are a big um, foundation. We find ourselves in a time of inflation now. We find ourselves in time where gas is, you know, five and six dollars a gallon, seven dollars a gallon in, in some states. And we, we find that the whole foundation seems to be eroding, not only in the political arena, but also in the financial uh, arena. And it's not necessary if we follow God's principles that he lays down in the scriptures. Well, we got to tell a story today. There are four kings over in the area of Sodom and Gomorrah by the Dead Sea that carry off Abram's nephew, Lot. If you remember, we left the story where Abram and Lot came out of Egypt. They came up to the Promised Land. They settled uh, near Bethel. And uh, the land could not support both of them. And so you remember that uh, Abram, in chapter 13, made a faith choice and said to Lot, I will trust God for whatever is left over, but let's divide the land. You go one direction, I'll go the other direction. Lot looked around, he looked at the edges of the city, he looked at things that were fertile, he looked at things that were uh, sight wealth, and he went for that. And what was left to Abram was faith wealth, but it was kind of a desert land. It wasn't the best parcel of land. And yet God blessed Abram because of his faith rather than looking at things by sight. And we said the principle was you need to look at life through faith eyes, not through your sight and trust that. So when we come to Genesis chapter 14, it says now the valley of Sedim was full of tar pits. And when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah down by the Dead Sea fled, there was battles going on between a lot of these kings. Some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings that invaded seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew. Remember, he was living in the shadow of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was living there by the Dead Sea, and there was a... a, a, a uh, 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 a sizable city there. Since he was living there in Sodom, they carried him off. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, in an effort to put down a rebellion, four powerful eastern kings 
invaded the Jordan Valley near the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, defeating all the forces in the region. Incidentally, the Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth. Um, plundering the five Jordanian kings and taking Lot captive. Now, I don't know how well you can see it on this map, but this is the area that we're talking about. Remember, Abram comes from Egypt with Lot, their families, all their cattle. The, the, uh, he comes to Hebron, he builds another altar in Bethel, and this is, uh, Hebron is about 22 miles south of Jerusalem. It's a place where David, when he becomes king, will set up a temporary uh, kingdom, uh, the capital of his kingdom for, I think, about 13 years, and then he finally uh, takes over the Jebusites and moves up to Jerusalem to establish his ultimate uh, kingdom. Um, Jerusalem's way, oh, I'm sorry, that's uh, Sea of Galilee. Uh, but anyway, Jerusalem will be 22 miles up here. But if you see, this is the Sea of Galilee, this is the Jordan River, and this is the Dead Sea. And Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, which are no longer in existence, but uh, they used to be called Bera, Beersha, uh, and this little town Bella, Zor, and they would flee out to Zor for a while. Uh, but that's all part of the, the, the Dead Sea, and uh, those two cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, were there before they were destroyed. We'll learn about that a little bit later. But that's the area that they're talking about. And so Abraham goes to fight to rescue Lot when he hears this news. Verse 13 of chapter 14, a man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now, Abram was living near, that's the first time, incidentally, in the scripture where Abram's called uh, Hebrew. Now, Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 13, 318 trained men born in his household. He had an army. 318 men and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, I didn't, let me go back here. Because he actually went quite a few miles north of Dan. There we go. All right, so he chased these kings from this area all the way up north of the Sea of Galilee. Dan is the, is the tribe that settled up here all the way up to about Hobah. So that was, that was quite, a, quite a battle, quite a trek. Now, you may not be into history and geography. I am, so I'm going to have to uh, uh, just kind of show it to you anyway. Then you get some concept of, uh, like the Holy Land. It's only about the size of New Jersey. So if you, if you were to take Israel, it's uh, basically uh, about the size of New Jersey. It's not a very big place. But on foot, it becomes a big place. Chapter 14, verse 15. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. So we're all the way up in what would today be uh, Damascus, Syria. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. Now, either those five kings or four kings were uh, disorganized and didn't have much of an army, or Abram and his 1,318 men were something else. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelioamer, one of the kings, and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him. This is the important part of the message today. We're not going to get to giving today except for a little, little bit, and then we're going to give you a whole thing next week on the story of Abram uh, paying a tithe or a tenth, and that's where that term tithe comes from, and next week we'll finish up on all of what that means for a New Testament believer. So after Abraham returned from defeating him, uh, the king of Solomon came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. Bible Knowledge Commentary tells us Abram the Hebrew, Ivri, 
was now recognized as a clan leader, so he had as much power as those kings did. This is the first occurrence, as I said in the Bible, of the word Hebrew, though the term Hebrew is not to be equated with the later group of marauding soldiers known as Kibaru, it may be etymologically, etymologically related. In fact, Abram's military activity in this chapter shows that this meaningful designation fits. He was thus forced to be reckoned with among the nations as he was settling in this area. Now a name comes up, and this name reoccurs in the Psalms and it reoccurs in the New Testament. And this is a person who came out to meet Abram after all the battle was over, after everything, and Abram was wanting to give praise to God. And this king comes out to meet him, but he's got a very, very special name in the Hebrew. It's pronounced Melchizedek, king of Salem. Anybody heard the name Jerusalem? What's the Salem? Anybody ever say hello in Hebrew? Shalom, right? Shalom is Salim. Uh, in the Arabic, it's Salim. I would say Salim to you, or Shalom. It means peace. It means peace. So Jerusalem is the city of peace. It's not really, but one day it will be. So in, in the Psalms, in the New Testament, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about this name, this person, this king of Salem, Melchizedek. Now, Melech, the first part of that Hebrew word, is king, Melchizedek. King of Salem brought bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high. Now, in the future, we'd have Levitical priests, right? That didn't happen yet because Abram was the father in the generations of Levi, where the Levitical priests came from, so they didn't even exist yet. But this person was some kind of priest, we don't know a whole lot about him. But he was a priest of God Most High, the Yahweh that Abram worshipped. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So here's this priest, king of Salem, king of peace, shows up out of nowhere and brings bread and wine after the battle and blesses Abraham. Where did this come from? We don't know anything more about him from this passage, really. Bible Knowledge Commentary, two kings met Abram on his return from the battle, his contrast, and they could not possibly have been more different. In contrast with the wicked city of Sodom and its ruler, Bera, who was also undoubtedly wicked, in contrast was Melchizedek, king of Salem, that is Jerusalem, from Psalm 76 later, a priest of God most high. Melchizedek's name, which means king of Melech is king, Zedek is righteousness, king of righteousness, suggests a righteous ruler who was God's representative. But we don't know much more about him. We, you know, as a priest, what, what area did he rule? We don't know. Some Bible students, including me, believe Melchizedek was a theophany. Remember in the garden, there was a theophany. Adam and Eve walked with God in the, in the garden. I thought God was invisible. I thought God was spirit. How could you walk with God in the garden? Guess who it was? The pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. We think of Jesus coming as a babe at Christmas time, and we, you know, in our human minds, we think, oh, that's the start of his life. But he's in eternity past. He's one with God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, something we don't understand very well. But he is pre-existent. He created the world. He holds the world together. He took on personality and a form. That's what theophany means. God is theos, 
taking on the imagery of a person. And he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Well, guess what? Here he comes, I believe, and I think Hebrews supports it. I believe that it's an appearance of the pre-incarnate Christ who met and brought bread and wine and blessed Abram. And this contrast between the evil and the wickedness of the king and the city and the righteousness, the prince of righteousness, the prince of peace coming. It's an amazing thing, the way the scriptures fit together. You'll find it in Psalm chapter, uh, uh, Psalm chapter 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. He's talking about Jesus Christ. This is a prophetic psalm. You're a priest forever. Ah, in the order of Levi. No. Jesus wasn't a priest in the order of Levi because that was insufficient. That was too much of humanity. You are a priest forever in a different order that came before Levi, that is eternal, Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and the king of peace. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath, the coming of Christ. He will judge the nations, the coming of Christ. This priest is going to do this. Jesus is going to do this in the order of Melchizedek. Heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole world, he will take control. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. So that is definitely that Melchizedek priesthood that it attributes to Jesus Christ. If you come to the book of Hebrews, and the point of the book of Hebrews, anybody know what the book of Hebrews is all about? You can put one word in there, superior. The writer to the Hebrews is demonstrating that Jesus is superior to angels because there were people who were worshiping angels and getting confused in that New Testament time. That Jesus is superior to Moses because Moses was not the savior. That Jesus is superior to the uh, Mosaic law and superior to the priesthood of Levi, superior to anything. You see, the Hebrews were wanting to go back to these new Hebrew Christians were getting pressured to go back to worship under the synagogue and the temple system and say, it's okay to be Christian, but you got to add your Judaism in there. You got to make sure you keep the law. You got to, you know, maybe we should abandon this and go back to this. And the writer says, no, no, no. Everything that Jesus did, God never called the Levites his sons in the way that he did Jesus Christ. He never said the law would save you the way he did with Jesus Christ. And so the whole point of Hebrews is, is Jesus' spirit. In Hebrews 5.5, 5, it says, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. He didn't appoint himself high priest. He was from the tribe of Judah. But God said to him, you are my son. This is a quote from the Psalms. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever, what we read from Psalm 110, in the order of Melchizedek. And so this writer to the Hebrews references back to the Old Testament and says, you're a priest forever in the order of the peacemaker, the king of righteousness, because you are the king of righteousness. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. But he was crucified anyway for God's good purposes. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Incidentally, the answer to prayer is sometimes you die. But God heard him and God did his will. And you remember what Jesus said before the cross. Not my will, Lord, but your will. Pick it up in verse 8. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. That doesn't mean there was anything wrong with him. He just went through a human experience and he learned what it was to perfectly obey God the Father in the midst of suffering, in the midst of hunger, in the midst of difficulty. And once made perfect, he was never imperfect. What was the perfection? 
it was a maturing process with life on earth. He had to grow from a 12, you know, a, a baby to a 12 year old who went to the temple to, a, you know, a 30 year old. And he had to look at all of life the way you and I look at life. He had to look at humanity the way you and I look at humanity. He had to look at all the sin and the suffering and all the neglect. And he had to deal with that like you and I look at situations and say, wow, that's wrong. But we learn. We gain in wisdom. And we're not perfect. He was. But he still learned those things. It was a learning curve and a learning experience without mistakes, without sins. He became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. How many of you knew what Melchizedek meant before you came in here? Oh, good, we're accomplishing. My preacher friend back there, Richard, he did. But he, he studies all the time. Jump to chapter 6 in the book of Hebrews, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. He's saying, don't abandon your Christian principles. Don't abandon your faith in Christ. Don't go back to Judaism. It won't do you any good. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Remember when Christ was crucified, the curtain, this heavy, heavy curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. No person could have done it. God did it. where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He went into the Holy of Holies, became the sacrifice, the perfect, ultimate sacrifice, like on the Day of Atonement. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then in chapter 7, the same thing. He, he spends three chapters talking about this king of peace, this king of righteousness. This Melchizedek was king of Salem, king of righteousness, was the king of peace, and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham, now the writer of the Hebrews changes his name from Abram to Abraham, and which it should be, and we'll see that in the future, returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. Wow, does that sound like Christ? I think the guy in the, who wrote the book of Hebrews thought so. And Abraham gave him a tenth. That's where we get the word tithe from, of everything. First, the name of Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, did Jesus Christ in his eternality have a father or mother other than the biological Mary? Without genealogy, you can't trace Christ's genealogy because you'd have to go back to the beginning and eternity, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God. Oh, this Melchizedek, king of Salem, resembles the Son of God. Pretty good parallels there, I think. And he remains a priest forever. The Levitical priests died. They couldn't remain priests forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abram gave him a tenth or a tithe of the plunder. Now, we're going to look next week at where that word tenth or tithe is used in the New Testament. But you're going to find out. I'll give you a hint. It's only used twice, maybe three times in the New Testament. And it all refers to Old Testament giving, not New Testament giving. It's a totally, totally different set of principles. But Abram did this. Now, I want to get back to the priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 8. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die. The Levitical priests would collect that. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. That is Jesus Christ and Melchizedek being priesthood. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, the Levitical priest would collect that tenth in the Old Testament. Levi paid the tenth through Abram. Because when Melchizedek met Abram, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. Levi hadn't been born. So Abram uh, gives this tenth to Melchizedek, and it's a concept that follows down through the generations.
as we close today, I want to remind you of that great name, Melchizedek. King of righteousness, king of peace. There is only one person in all of eternal existence that fits that description. And that one person, if you've trust him, is your savior. That one person that Abram came out and met in contrast to the evil king was the righteous king. The one who will rule and reign forever and if he's in your heart, makes all the difference in the world. Now we will look at this principle of the tithe next week. And I've got great news for you. In fact, I have, as the Bible says, hilarious news. Because God says he loves a cheerful giver. That word is hilarious. That when you put money in the offering, your side is splitting. I know that sounds extreme. But it ought to be a joy. It ought not to be somebody giving you pressure, and we'll talk about that next week. But based on the fact that you have peace, you have righteousness, you're declared righteous, perfect, perfected in Jesus Christ, and have forgiveness of sins and eternal hope, why would you hold on to any of it? Why would you, why would you clutch to your life? And we do. You know, we're afraid that we won't make ends meet, and God always says, I, I've got your back. You know, and I know there are people starving to death, there's injustice, there's all kinds of garbage going around in our world. And Jesus said that, you'll, you'll have the poor with you forever. And he could have said, you'll have the corrupt with you forever. And that's what's tilting the scales, that's what's ruining everything. And sadly, because we still live in sinful bodies, we're part of that corruption. We don't want to be, but we're part of it. But God's rescued us from that through this king of righteousness, through this king of peace. I hope he dwells in your heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. It's a great and awesome time to be alive. Yes, there are pressures, but what we have in a foundation for our lives, even if our communities don't have it, even if our government doesn't have it, even if our world doesn't have it, we have it. We have that foundation of peace. We have that foundation of righteousness. We have the scriptures that can make sense to us so that we know how to have our lives guided. One of the Psalms says, your word is a lamp under my feet. It's guidance for my path. And when we know you and we know your principles and we know your foundation, we can get through life by the power of the Holy Spirit, by trusting in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what's happening in our business. Doesn't matter what's happening at work. I mean, they're not necessarily nice things sometimes, but you're there with us. Every time we go to work, you go with us as Savior. Every time we teach someone, every time we drive our car, everything we do, you are there with us and we need to practice that presence of God. So we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name.